good morning. Thank you, Rob. Welcome to worship at Marshall United Methodist Church. My name is Erin Fitzgerald, and I'm the pastor here. I hope you had a happy and a safe 4th of July holiday, and I want to thank you for choosing to spend part of your long weekend with us here at Marshall UMC. As I welcome you to worship, I want to make a special point of welcoming our guests and our visitors who are here with us in the room and those who are worshiping with us online on Facebook. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. I want to encourage you to fill out the connection cards that are in your black folders on your tabletops today. This is our way of connecting you to what God is doing in and through the life of Marshall UMC. You can share your contact information, a confidential prayer request, and you can also scan the QR code, which will take you to our church website, where you'll find our staff roster, our master calendar, and our giving page as well. This week, there are a couple of things coming up that I want to make sure you know about. Uh, the first is on Tuesday, July 9th. Everybody needs to go have lunch or breakfast at Pastrami Joe's in downtown Marshall. Uh, Pastrami Joe's was very gracious to host a fundraiser for our free store, There's Enough. And uh, all of the purchases that are made that day, whether it's a soup or a salad or a sandwich or a cup of coffee, the pro some of the proceeds will be donated back to There's Enough to continue our incredible and vital ministry in downtown Marshall. So I hope you go hungry. I hope that um, you take a friend with you. And if you don't have one of the postcards, um, please grab one on your way out. Ed is holding them. They're at that back table. Thanks, Ed. Um, we are also hosting a quilt show this week. Um, this is the annual quilt show for the Calco Quilters Guild. And they are an amazing group of artisans who spend hours and hours and hours every year putting together quilts and uh, fiber art so that you can enjoy it for this show. Uh, the show will take place on Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th from 9 to 4 every day. Um, and when you come in this door, the whole church is completely transformed. And it looks like an amazing museum of just beautiful, vibrant, soft quilts and fabrics. Um, every color that you could imagine is present. And so I really hope that you'll come and see it if you have not seen it before. There's no ticket or reservation required. You can pay at the door, and you can also uh, get refreshments here as well. These are all the announcements I have for you now. Will you stand and join us for our opening song, Glorious Day? Welcome to church, church. Let's go. <laughs> Till I met 
is heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. And our next song, I Thank God. This is the one we did last week. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all. Just when the fire is slowly drifting, a bad Sing about you, sing. 
kids to come on down and hang out with me just for a second. And then we're going to do noisy. I like it. And then I'm going to do noisy offering with you all. Yes, you all are so colorful and so beautiful. I just love it so much. So who is enjoying summer so far? I love them. Yes, I am enjoying summer. I see that rainbow. It's beautiful. Who has been swimming or to the beach this summer? Me. Yes. Me. You did? Very good. Who has had ice cream this summer? Like, like a lot of ice cream, right? Yeah. And with your mama, you had ice cream? That's very nice. Exactly. And who has been to a playground this summer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I so the playground and I, and I know me too. And I, go home. I know you played and you played and then you went home. That's how it works, isn't it? So summer is a lot of fun. And you know what else? Summer is a time when we get ready to go back to school. Now, you're going into fifth grade. What grade are you going to? Fifth? Third? Third? Are you going to be a kindergartner? Preschool, yes, you're just starting at school. It's so exciting. I'm starting at school. Okay, there's a little bit of snow. Really? You're going to grow up and be a doctor? Yeah. Good idea. You go to school every day. So, what we need to do today, friends, is we need to take up an offering, a noisy offering for backpack blessings, because even though we're still enjoying summertime and the beach and the playgrounds and ice cream right now, we have to get ready for going back to school. And one way as we do that at church is by collecting school supplies. Did you see any school supplies in the hallway this morning? Yes. And today we're going to take up a noisy offering. Uh huh. It was really nice. That's great. So I'm going to give you all a pot. I'm going to give you all a pot, and I need your help today, friends. You may have the little one. I had a feeling. I'm going to give you all a pot, and then you're going to go around, and you're going to collect all the monies from the people. We take noisy money. We take soft money. We take online money. It's pretty cool. And, um, and I, while you collect it, I'm going to talk about backpack blessings, okay? That's it. Yeah, or you could take this one. Which one you want? Okay, good. Go get him, Tiger. Good. Do you want to? You want to just? Yeah. So as we collect our school supplies, they will be distributed at the Calhoun County Fair on Kids Day, which is uh, a Tuesday of Fair Week. And we will give them to students in Marshall Public Schools and anyone else who would like one. Uh, just like God loves everyone everywhere, we are willing and able to be generous to all students everywhere. Our goal this summer is to collect supplies for 250 backpacks. Last year, those were all distributed by 11 a.m. So uh, they go quick, and we're grateful to be able to offer that support. If you would like to be one of our shoppers for school supplies, we have a list of supplies that we are collecting out in the Great Hall. You can take that with you when you go grocery shopping at Meijer or Walmart or Sam's or wherever you go, and you can bring those supplies back to the church. And if you are someone who uses Amazon, make sure that you look in the midweek for our Amazon wish list link, and then you can do your shoppings from the convenience of your pool floaty and you <laughs> thank you friends go ahead and dump it good work excellent work excellent work and then we're going to dump it in the big one yeah right. oh boy oh boy okay i'll take it thank you all right pots pots under my table right here my altar table please thank you wonderful work wonderful work oh thank you friends Thank you so much. What a big helper. All right, now can you guys stand up and help me bless the offering? We're going to say thank you to God for all the generosity of our church. Okay, I'll say some words you repeat after me. Ready? Dear God, thank you for today. 
Thank you for these gifts. Help us use them to buy school supplies for all the students who are not quite ready to go back to school. Bless the teachers and the principals. Help them rest and be safe this summer. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. So today, friends, our nursery is open, but there is not kids' worship because Miss Maddie is at camp. And so you get to stay in church with me. Yay! Isn't that exciting? So you may go back to your seats, or you may choose to go to nursery and have an adult sign you in. Good morning. In the midst of this summer, we are moving through a sermon series about conflict. Conflict in our personal lives, in our professional lives, even in our church and our communal lives. And the, uh, the conflict sermon series started out last week, and we talked about avoidance and estrangement and feeling like conflict is so difficult sometimes that we just don't even want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And this week, we're going to talk about conflict as it manifests in terms of gossip, in terms of triangulation, in terms of passive-aggressive behavior. And sometimes these are ways that we deal with conflict in, uh, in terms of avoidance, and it's a coping strategy for sure, but is it always the healthiest coping strategy? Is it the best communication tool that we have in our toolbox? And so as we talk about gossip and triangulation and passive-aggressive behavior, I want to really level the playing field, saying that this is a part of my life, and it's a part of your lives, and it's a part of our communal life together. It happens in schools. It happens in factories. It happens in restaurants. It happens all over the place. And so we all do it, and we can all learn ways to be healthy as we deal with conflict in this way. So raise your hand if you have ever heard or used the phrase, I heard it through the grapevine, or a little bird told me. Have you ever heard those phrases? Yes, yes. So this is the beginning of gossip. And sometimes it even happens uh, around the water cooler at work or at the coffee station at work. And I want to start today by saying that there are three types of gossip, and they're not all bad. There's neutral gossip, there's positive gossip, and then there's negative gossip. Neutral gossip is perhaps one of the most common because neutral gossip is where we're just sharing points of information so that everybody knows what's up. Hey, did you hear that if we eat at Pastrami Joe's on Tuesday, July 9th, there's enough benefits from that and gets a portion of the sales? Yay! Hey, did you hear that Maddie Martinson is at Lake Louise this week with 10 of our youth from Marshall United Methodist? They're going to have a great week Christian camping. 
yay. These are all neutral kinds of gossip that don't hurt, that don't harm. They actually help and uplift because folks are sharing points of information and getting to know what they need in community. There's also positive gossip, where we share uplifting pieces of information with the best of intentions. We celebrate and we share with people in the midst of their joy. Hey, did you hear that Beatrice's cancer is in remission and she's feeling a whole lot better? Yay! A little bird told me that your daughter got her driver's license and she passed her road test. This is wonderful news. These are all things that we want to share and celebrate in the midst of community. You can talk positively and affirm and admire your friends and family and neighbors and even strangers. On the flip side of neutral and positive gossip is negative gossip, of course. And this is where we find ourselves expressing judgment, where we share information without consent, when we are disrespectful, and maybe even say something that humiliates another person. Did you hear that her husband had an affair with a prostitute? These are how scandals get started. These are how rumors get started. These are how people get their feelings hurt. And in the Bible, there are a couple different places that talk about gossip. And one of them is in the book of James in the third chapter, verse 5. And here's what it says. So as the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. So... Our tongue is a muscle in our body, and it's certainly not the biggest muscle. We have other muscles that are bigger, but our tongue is one of the strongest muscles in our body. And James acknowledges the strength of that and says that the tongue is like a fire, and it can burn anything that we touch with our words. James said, consider how great a forest is set ablaze by even a small spark. Have you ever had or heard or participated in something that was really hot and it became gossip and soon the whole town knew about it? Never. In a town of 7,000 of Marshall, Michigan, have we ever done this? Oh, good, good. <laughs> what, what this reminds me of is the image of a campfire. And perhaps it's because our church is really in the midst of camping season and getting ready to go to camp, that campfires can create warmth and they can create community. That's the place where we gather on the beach, often in a circle, where we sit in our, in our camp chairs and we share stories and we laugh and we pray, where we roast s'mores, where everybody can come together in the midst of a cool, pure Michigan night and have a good time. Sometimes our words enable us to do that, to gather in community, to experience warmth, to experience affection, and to experience a positive time. Other times, campfires can be kind of dangerous, right? If you don't practice safety, if you uh, get hit by a spark, if you touch one of the s'mores poles that's been in the fire for too long, you'll burn your fingers. And so our words, when they are Warm can also create wounds. So what we can learn from the book of James is that we can choose to participate in gossip or not. As Christ followers, we make a choice every day about the words that we say and the things that we do. We can choose to participate in gossip or not. You can choose to clarify a fact or you can correct misinformation or misunderstanding. You can choose to change the subject and walk away. You can choose to listen or engage. In one of my previous churches in Rochester, Michigan, we had a situation where there was a position available on staff and several of the church uh, employees were interviewing and applying for that position. 
One of the staff members ended up being promoted after a rather rigorous and lengthy interview process. And news started to circulate one day in the church workroom at the copy machine, where the coffee machine also was. And people were just sort of gossiping and, and talking and saying, well, I heard that she applied for it. <gasps> oh, really? I didn't know that. I heard that it was going to go to this person. Oh, no, no, you don't have that right. You know how it goes, right? You've been there. And I was approached by someone. I went in to check my mail in the workroom, and I was reaching up to grab all the items out of my mailbox. And, and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, Pastor Aaron, do you know who it's going to be? Do you know who got the job? And I had to make a choice in that moment. I turned around and I said, I honestly don't know, and I'm not comfortable talking about it right now. It's not public information yet, and I don't want to be disrespectful to the Staff Parish Relations Committee or to any of the applicants. Let's change the subject. Let's all be adults and move on, and we'll be ready for the announcement when it comes. I hope and pray that in certain situations where you need to be so bold, when you need to be so forthright and clear about what is happening in the midst of gossip, in the midst of these conversations, that you can rise above some of these behaviors, of some of these judgments that are cast, that you would use your words to uplift and care for others in community rather than do harm. When it, when it comes to um, thinking about communication and how it happens, whether it's in the workroom or whether it's on the city streets or whether it's in your own home, the Bible and Jesus have a few things to say about communication. And one of the things that is a red thread all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament around communication is that we should be as clear and direct and honest as possible. As clear and direct and honest as possible. And if we can be gracious and loving and polite while we are being clear and direct and honest, that's even better. That's the cherry on top of the sundae. One of the places where this appears is in the Gospel of Matthew in the fifth chapter where Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you're invited out to lunch with a friend but you really don't have time or energy to go, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be clear and direct and honest, gracious and loving and polite. If you are uh, talking with someone and they are casting something out into the world that feels like judgment being spewed and you are the person who is uncomfortable in that scene, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Say, I want to spend time with you, but I am not going to talk about this. Let's find something else. The the trick of communicating with other human beings, with people in real life scenarios, is one that often gets messy and complicated, and it's one where we see a lot of dysfunction. It's one where we don't always get it right. I wonder if you've ever had one of these situations where what you were trying to say got misinterpreted, and and your words got turned around in such a way that you didn't mean them to come out that way. Have you ever had that happen? Sure, of course. I also wonder if you heard something but you weren't sure what it meant and you had to go back and ask for clarification. You had to go back and ask for more information. Well, communication is the primary way that we build relationships as a society. Communication is the primary way that we find belonging between two people, between two groups, between businesses and between institutions. And every person longs for connection. Every person longs for community and for love and respect. And so communication is something that we want to work really, really hard on each and every day. 
there's a, there's a video that I think portrays this beautifully, and it's a video that Pixar put out and, uh, called WALL-E. Have you ever seen WALL-E? wall is one of my favorite Pixar movies, and one of the things I love about it is that there's not a lot of script. There's not a lot of dialogue in Wally. There's so much that's communicated with the music and with the animation and with the emotions of the characters, but there's not a lot of words. For those of you who haven't seen it, Wally is a robot who lives in kind of an apocalyptic time on Earth when there's no human beings left on Earth. It's just a big pile of trash. Wally works in the landfill on Earth, and his job is to collect the trash, scoop it up into his belly, shake it on down into a, a cube, and stack it up into piles for these big excavators to, to come and move. And uh, there's another robot, another mechanical creature named Eva. And Eva in the movie is a robot who lives on a space station. She lives in outer space. And her work on, uh, in the movie is to come to Earth and to search for signs of life amidst all of the rubble, amidst all of the trash and all the recyclables. Eva's job is to come and look for plants and for animals and for clean water and for pure air. And Wally and Eva run into each other when Eva is on a mission looking for life, and they find a way to connect. Can we view that video clip? We could keep watching just the whole movie. It's so great. 
So in that scene, we saw Wally and Eva connect in the uh, little container ship that Wally uses as his home. It's the place where Wally connects all the toys and trinkets that he finds in the landfill that he thinks are still special and still have meaning and worth. And one of those items was a hubcap that he used as his hat as he was showing Eva what it looks like to dance. Another item was the lighter that she found on the shelf. And so they connected over this music, over this movie scene that played on his old TV set. And you saw him start to dance, and then you saw Eva try to connect and try to find a way to do it by all the jumping, 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 and that kind of caused a, a ruckus. And then you saw Wally try to reach for her little mechanical hand, and then like a sheepish boy, whoop, put his hand down when she pulled away. This desire to be close, this desire to connect and find relationship and intimacy is all about what it's like to be in community, to be in relationship. Wally wants to be close to Eva, and we want to be close to the people in our family and in our church and in our school and at our workplaces. Family systems theory, though, would say that there are varying degrees of closeness and separation. There are people who are easy to be close to, who are easy to be in relationship with, and there are people who a little extra grace is required because it's more challenging to be in relationship with them. Think about your own life and your own family. Are there people that you more easily connect to that you are closer in relationship with than others? Maybe you have a sister or someone who is very close to you. Maybe it's a second cousin that you just get along with really well and you have for your whole life. Perhaps there's another person, an uncle that you just don't talk about for reasons. Maybe there's a neighbor three doors down that you'd really prefer to not interact with because he's just kind of a bane. There are people in our life where we desire to be close and there are others where we desire to be separate. And when we think about gossip, when we think about triangulation or even passive aggressive behavior, what we're really trying to navigate is how close or how separate we want to be with those people. If I'm going to um, gossip and say, well, I heard this about her, I don't want to be super close and actually have a conversation with her, but I want to find out more information by going in between. And this is called triangulation, when one person talks to a second person in order to get to a third person. You can literally draw the shape of a triangle between person A, B, and C. If you think about the game of keep away, or it was monkey in the middle when I was growing up, it's where you have a ball and you throw the ball to the person on the far edge, even though you're playing with three people, and the poor guy in the middle has to try to jump up and reach the ball as it's getting from point A to point B in order to engage. That's actually a game of triangulation. And triangulation happens all the time in the midst of our daily lives, right? We have all had experiences or examples where maybe our kid comes to mom because dad told him no about something. Dad, can I stay up late and, and play video games with my friends until 3 a.m.? Dad says no, come to mom and try again. You've been there, right? Maybe it's not video games, maybe it's a cookie. We've all had situations where in the midst of our parents' aging and, and caretaking, uh, one sibling seems to relate better to, to mom in the midst of a need. And so sister is the one who approaches mom to say, I really think it might be time to add us to your checking account or take away the car keys or start talking about assisted living. Have you been there? One sister communicates a little better with mom than the other? Yes. It happens in, in positive ways, too, sometimes. Triangulation is not always bad. When you have a medical issue and you go to the doctor to try to diagnose what's happening, sometimes your doctors need to form a triangle. The pulmonologist needs to talk to the cardiologist, and they need to talk to the radiologist in order to really understand what's happening with you. 
Maybe it's that you are working on a project at work and you have a couple of coworkers that you need to consult their expertise and their wisdom in order to have a successful project completed on time. There are a few stories in the Bible where triangulation happens too, and they are often in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 10 in the Gospel of Luke, Mary and Martha and Jesus are in a triangle. They're hosting a dinner party, and Jesus is in attendance. And Martha's running all over the house, cooking and cleaning and trying to make sure everything is perfect. And meanwhile, Mary is sitting innocently at Jesus' feet, soaking up everything he has to say. And Martha gets pissed. And she goes to Jesus, and she complains and says, Jesus, I'm working all the time over here. I'm going nonstop, running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And Mary's not even lifting a finger to help. The other place where it appears in the Gospel of Luke is when the disciples are embroiled in a dispute and they're, they're arguing about who is the greatest amongst us. They're trying to develop their own social hierarchy in, in this totem pole where they figure out who's the best, who's the smartest, who's the strongest, and they go to Jesus to try to solve their problems. They create a triangle. Triangulation can be productive sometimes when the doctors are working together, when a family is working together, but triangulation can also lead to manipulation and to deception and to hurt feelings. Triangulation is where we try to determine how we can be close to one another while also remaining separate. In the church, I see triangulation happen all the time, and often it happens in really good and, and wonderful ways, because what will happen is um, I'll receive a prayer request from a third person, and it'll say, well, can you please, please pray for Linda, because I heard that she's having uh, a hard time this week, and then we're able to surround Linda with a community of love and support. Other times, triangulation happens when we're simply trying to network in Christian community and build some social capital where you say, hey, do you know anybody who knows about hostas? Because the deer are really just attacking my hostas, and I'm trying to figure out how to stop them. And they say, you know who you should talk to? Marty Overheiser. He knows everything about hostas, and he's known it for a long time in the city of Marshall. There's other ways that triangulation happens in the church, and it's where we share ideas and where we share passions and where we work together to do big, hard things. The community garden that's just right behind us is a beautiful example of triangulation because when that idea was, was planted in the church's mind that we would develop a community garden and we'd be able to feed our neighbors. We started to build relationships. We started to share ideas about what vegetables we should do and how we should build the beds and whether or not we needed a fence and if we could all work together on it to make it a sustainable project. Triangulation is not always all bad, but it is a way that we try to bring ourselves close together while still remaining separate. The last thing I want to talk about today in terms of conflict and conflict avoidance is this thing called passive-aggressive behavior. Now, just as a caveat, I know that none of you are passive-aggressive. You're just pure on aggressive. I know that none of you have never used your body language, like crossed arms. None of you have ever rolled your eyes or used sarcasm. None of you have ever said everything's fine when it's really not fine. You've never tried to indirectly express your feelings without openly addressing them, right? You've never experienced a friend or family member giving you the cold shoulder or ignoring your phone calls. You've never had the experience of sensing that someone was annoyed with you or put off by you, but really not understanding why. 
Sometimes when it comes to passive aggressive behavior, we are in a place where we're so overwhelmed with our emotions that we're really not aware of which one we're experiencing. And we're also not aware of how we can communicate it in a healthy and peaceful and safe way. So passive aggressive behavior tends to be this thing where we harbor our feelings, where we hurt ourselves and we hurt others because we don't openly express our feelings in this way that is clear and direct and honest and grace filled. Feelings that don't get expressed, we know from experience perhaps, turn into bitterness and into resentment. They settle into a grudge that we carry, and that grudge becomes so heavy, so burdensome, that sometimes a lot of time passes where we're not able to talk about it, where we're not able to be in that close relationship. And sometimes we're not even sure when the problem started or, or with who or where it happened. If we were to go back to the book of James and think about the fire analogy, the tongue of someone who has manifested passive-aggressive behaviors is like the spark that has been engulfed in flames after lighter fluid has been poured on it. Because after a while, you're so weighed down, you're so overwhelmed, you're so burdened by all of these things, and every little thing just keeps piling on and piling on that you're going to explode. The emotions are going to come out one way or another. And it may come out on the person who harmed you in the first place. It may come out on someone else who is just an innocent bystander, right? When we are harboring and holding on to all these emotions, it's very, very difficult to untangle them. It's very, very difficult to address them and to continue to be in relationship. I want to tell you an honest story about a time in my life when my grandmother manifested passive aggressive behavior and it was thanksgiving day we had arrived to my grandmother's house the whole family descended to their house in schoolcraft michigan and we walked in and it was all those wonderful thanksgiving smells that filled the house the turkey that had been baking in the oven and the pumpkin pie and all the things that make your mouth water around the thanksgiving holiday and the grandkids in our family, I'm the oldest, uh, we have this tradition of kind of stripping off our winter coats and our winter boots and, and dropping them like hot potatoes and running down to the basement to play and to play board games. And we were all at the age where Sorry and Monopoly and Battleship were the games that we wanted to play and the cousins hadn't been together in a long time. And so we walked in and we stripped all of our winter coats off and took our boots off and we went downstairs to play. After about an hour, I think, my grandmother came down and she said, all right, guys, all right, you've had your fun. Now it's time to get upstairs. You got to help me set the table. You got to help me clear some pots and pans off the stove. And I need you to, I need you to get to work here with me. And we said, nah. We don't want to. We're going to stay down here and we're going to we're going to play. You guys can do it up there. The moms and the dads and the uncles and the aunts. So grandma retreated. She went back up the stairs and and soon as we became aware of what was happening, all we could hear was the clinking and the clanging of pots and pans in a very dramatic fashion. And all we could hear was the slamming of cupboard doors and the refrigerator and and then sure enough, all of our boots and all of our coats were coming flying down the basement stairs. And it's as if someone was annoyed by our behavior. It's as if someone was trying to communicate without openly expressing their feelings towards us. And it was my grandmother. And she was upset. And it turned out that she really wanted our help with the dishes and with setting the table and finishing the meal preparations because she had been working so hard all day long to achieve this perfect family picture of a holiday meal. 
and we shrugged it off. We're not passive aggressive, are we? You've never done anything like that. The thing of it is, in that situation, I was aware that I wanted that, that closeness, that intimacy, that relationship with my cousins. I wanted to spend time with them. What I wasn't aware of was that my grandmother also was craving that and pining after that. And her inviting us up to help set the table and clean the pots and pans was her way of connecting with us. It was her way of reaching out, just like Wally reached out to Eva. Relationships are so beautiful and so wonderful, but they are also messy and complicated sometimes. And it all hinges, I think, on how we are able to be vulnerable and communicate our emotions, how we're able to engage one another in our relationships. So if if we're to take anything away from this sermon today on gossip and triangulation and passive aggressive behavior, the question I really want to ask is if communication is hard and conflict is healthy, then how do we find this equilibrium? How do we find this place where we can faithfully approach our human relationships and the conflict that's going to be there no matter what? How do we navigate a respectable norm in the midst of our day and age? And once again, I think the answer comes from Jesus. It comes from the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew in the, th in the um, 18th chapter. And this is the, the passage of scripture that's known as the rule of Christ. And this is where Christ is speaking about how to be clear and direct and honest and gracious in the midst of conflict. Jesus says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Don't gossip about it. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. You are still in relationship with that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, if it still falls on deaf ears, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen to even the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. So here we see Jesus saying that, that conflict is real. We know that one or two of you are going to have a dispute every single diggity dog on day, and you're going to have to work on it. Conflict avoidance is not always the best resolution. But Jesus says gossip is not always the best resolution either. Triangulation isn't always the best resolution either. Slamming cupboard doors and throwing winter coats down the stairs isn't the best resolution either. Jesus says clear, direct, honest communication is best. Go to the person with whom you are having a problem and speak to them. Be direct, be honest, confront the issue with your words as graciously as possible. And if that doesn't work, then seek help. Seek the help of one or more brothers and sisters in Christ who are willing to be witnesses, who are willing to help you mediate a conversation, who are willing to help you f navigate your way towards peace and reconciliation. And then if that doesn't work, go to a bigger body. Go to the court. Go to the church council. Go ask for professional intervention. And then, only then, if that doesn't work, then you can drop them like a hot potato and walk away from the conflict, walk away from the relationship. But Jesus wants you to try at least three things. He wants you to give it a good, honest college try before you walk away from relationship. And so if we think about our conflicts, if we think about our relationships, if we think about all the things that are broken and messy and unreconciled in our lives, I wonder if, I wonder if we could relate to this, uh, this quote by Jar... Jar <coughs> I wonder if we could relate to this quote by George Bernard Shaw, 
who says the single biggest problem in communication is the assumption that it has taken place at all. The single biggest problem in communication is the assumption that it has taken place at all. If we are not practicing the rule of Christ, if we are not going to our family member or our friend or our neighbor with whom we are having a conflict and communicating what has happened, then there is our base issue, that there is no communication And similarly, we have to ask the question that another Bernard, Bernard Metzler, says, when you are speaking to one another, ask yourself these questions. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? And if the answer is no, then perhaps what you are about to say should be left unsaid. So if we're going to confront conflict within the way of Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of Matthew, we have to go to the person with whom we have a problem, and then we have to be clear and direct and honest, and we have to ask, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? And if not, if we cannot confront the problem with the grace and love of Jesus Christ, then perhaps... We need to take it to prayer. Perhaps we need to seek the advice and the wisdom of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Perhaps we need to ask for professional intervention when the pastor or a counselor or someone else gets involved and helps us to untangle what's really going on, what's at the heart of this issue, and how we can best approach it with the grace and love of Jesus Christ. As we go into an election season, as we continue to live our lives of faith and deal with our families and deal with conflicts in the workplace and adjust to a a new school year, I hope that this sermon series will lay a foundation for how we can do so in a faithful and healthy way. We are human beings with a full range of human emotions, and God gave us these emotions as a gift. God also gave us relationships as a gift. And so as we navigate these sticky and tricky relationships, we always know that Christ walks with us. And if we can't muster the grace to be in relationship, then Jesus Christ himself will always, always, Deal with us with compassion and tender mercy and love. There is more grace in God than there is conflict in us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we're so blessed to know you and to have this awareness that you know us and you love us inside and out, broken and imperfect as we may be. God, we've been made in your image and in your likeness, and so we know that we have been made to be in relationship with each other. So help us draw near to you and to each other. Help us to enjoy all the wonderful aspects of summer with family time and travel and vacations. Help us to form unique and close-knit bonds where we can experience your love and your incarnate presence. Help us also, O God, to be peacemakers, to be peacemakers in our own family, in our church, in in your community, and in the kingdom. Help us to model our lives after the example of your son, Jesus, who was the one who walked with us and talked with us and experienced the emotional roller coaster of being a human, of weeping with his friends, of turning over tables in the temple when he was angry, of being caught in the midst of jealousy at Mary and Martha's house and with the disciples. 
O oh God, when we are caught in these same webs of conflict, help us to use the peace and reconciling nature of Jesus Christ that is a spark that exists within all of us. May you fan that flame, O oh God, and may you help us to be your faithful people so that we may serve you and our neighbors through the ministries and programs of this church. Hear us now as we pray, O oh God, the prayer that your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to join in our morning offering and partner with us in ministry here at MUMC. Your financial gifts support all the good work we are doing here at MUMC. Please give generously as we worship God by sharing our gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can use our drive up offering box, the donation station at the back of the great room, or you can give online by visiting our webpage, umcmarshall.org. You can also give by scanning the QR code found inside the black folders on the tables. Thank you for joining us again in worship this morning, and hopefully everyone had a great week and a great, safe, fun, relaxing fourth. Um, it's been a great week filled with family, having time off from daycare and stuff too. So I've been very thankful for the time to spend with my family right now. If you can please stand and join us in our closing song, Flawless.
matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you Thank you again. So I have one more little announcement before I send everyone off. So you guys did so well tearing down the room for VBS. Do you see where I'm going with this? So we have our quilt show that's coming up starting tomorrow. They're going to start doing setup and everything. So we would greatly appreciate it for anyone who's able and willing to stick around after the service. Just the same thing, getting the whole entire room cleared off, off to the sides. We would greatly appreciate it. More hands make easy work. So we greatly appreciate it. Now receive this blessing. May you go from this place blessed with divine contentment and the deep and beautiful knowledge that in all things the power of Christ dwells in you. Amen. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. You like to move it. I like to move it.